I'm, I'm Captain Ahab. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my, foot's, my right foot's in, in, a, in a walking boot uh, because uh, I had a small break when on vacation uh, in Italy and it wasn't getting better. Uh, I'm Michael Montgomery, not Captain Ahab. Our, <laughs> uh, if you're a visitor, if you could find this visitor card in the pew in front of you and fill it out, we would appreciate the opportunity to get to know you better. Please join us for coffee and refreshments downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. Next Sunday, we will celebrate the conclusion of our stewardship campaign and remember those whom we love who died in the past year, and we'll have a celebratory meal after this worship service, so be sure to come. There will also be a congregational meeting, and to which I turn to Dennis for the official announcement. So official. It is. Good morning, everybody. Um, you've probably received in the mail now um, the announcement for the congregational meeting uh, next Sunday between services at 930. And we're going to uh, discuss and take a vote on expenditures uh, required to repair um, the ceiling and some other things that we've discovered in the, in the course of looking at the issue. So I hope that you can be here uh, next Sunday at 930 for the congregational meeting. If you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to answer them for you, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we are beginning a series of focus groups, which are small gatherings of members who fit particular uh, characteristics. So we'll have a group of people who have been members for over 50 years. We'll have another group of people who are parents of young children. And we will lead off next Sunday with a focus group of people who would self-identify as being gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. If that applies to you, see me, and we'll get you in the group. Uh, the worship of God includes love of neighbor. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. Good morning. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship, and if you are able, please stand. Listen, listen, listen. We know pain and longing, but the woundedness of our lives is not the end. We are not hopeless. God has blessed us with Jesus, blessed us with love, Bless us with hope. Praise be to God.
please join me in the responsive prayer of the day. This is taken from the UCC Statement of Faith. We believe in you, O God, eternal spirit, God of our Savior Jesus Christ, and in our God, and to your deeds we testify. You call the worlds into being, create persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You judge people and nations by your righteous will, declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Savior, you have come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the world to yourself. You bestow upon us your Holy Spirit, renewing the Church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages and races, and races. You call us into your Church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be your servants in the service of others, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, and resist the powers of evil to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. You promise to all who trust you forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, your presence in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in your realm, which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto you. Amen.
Hi, where are you off to? I'm going to church. Oh, really? Which one? I go to find our <clears throat> first congregational. It's UCC. Oh, I've heard of them. Unitarians considering Christ. Very funny. No, and neither is it the Uniform Commercial Code. It's the United Church of Christ. Okay, I've heard of them. What, what do you believe? Oh, that can be hard to describe because we believe that everyone needs to come to their own faith stand, their own beliefs, and each generation must decide for itself what it means to follow Jesus in their day. Hmm. No creeds that you have to believe? No minister telling you what to believe if you are going to get into heaven? <laughs> no creeds, but we do write and use the occasional statement of faith or mission statement. And who knows what the minister might say? <laughs> True, that's everywhere. So, you are another Jesus sent a church like, forgive me, Jesus, for I have sinned, or whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, Jesus. You're, you're poking fun at Southerners. Don't do it. It's not nice. And I guess we don't not believe that Jesus forgives sins or brings eternal life, but it's more than that, really. More? More like... Love your neighbors as yourself, like your homeless neighbor, your black neighbor, your conservative neighbor, your Muslim neighbor, your queer neighbor. The list goes on. Jesus was always reaching out to people who were outside of acceptability, and so do we. Have you taken Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I mean, that's what Billy Graham said was all you had to do. <laughs> He said that was all you had to do to start. And yes, I suppose, as someone who wants to be a progressive, a liberal Christian, I take Jesus as my Lord and Savior every day. It's not always easy. There is so much anger and fear in the world, and I know that the anger and the fear of the world shapes me, shapes me too. So why try? I mean, Jesus has to love you. It's his job. If, if someone has to do something, it might be a duty, but it's not love. Do you really believe that? I mean, you're all about different causes. Hunger, women's rights, environmentalism, gay rights, peace and justice. You can go on and on. <laughs> it can get pretty busy. But I find that different people specialize in different things. We generally don't agree on everything, but that's okay. It's the journey that counts. So why Jesus? I mean, why not go straight to results and give money to fund a lobbyist or something? <laughs> why Jesus? I suppose I've learned from him. He's the fullest example of the potential of human living that I've ever seen. And there is a sense that he is with me, especially when life gets hard or there is scary work to be done. And I suppose because Jesus loved me first. I'm just responding to that love the best way I can. Yeah, but look where it got him. Seated at the right hand of God, the Father, uh, seated at the right hand of God the Father, from whence the he shall judge the quick and the dead. Hey, I thought you didn't do creeds. <laughs> Sorry, you're right. I just couldn't resist the temptation. But you're right, he got killed. It's just that it's, his death wasn't the end. You mean there's more? There's much more. Figuring out what is, is why I go to church. Want to join me? Sure. I would invite the, the children, the child to come forward. <laughs> Look what I've got. You're, you're going to have to touch this. See what that is? Yeah, that's called a, it's called a walking boot because I twisted my ankle and it's broken a little bit. Not much, and it doesn't hurt. 
Oh, but to get better, I have to wear this. Have you ever had an owie? Yeah, did it hurt? No, it didn't hurt? Oh, <laughs> you're tougher than I am. Oh, and what did you do when you had the owie? You hurt your leg, and then did you, did you see a doctor? Yes, you did see a doctor. Ooh, who did you see first? Uh-huh. And did you talk to your mom or dad? You went to your dad, okay. And then he took you to the doctor? Oh, that was kind of good of him. And did he hold you and tell you he loved you and was sorry? Yeah. Did that make it help feel better? Well, I'm glad. And Jesus is the same way for us, that when we're hurting, we go to Jesus and say, it hurts, and it gets better. Just like telling your mom or your dad that something's hurt, they can help you get better all over again. Are you as good as new now? Well, and someday I will be too, though perhaps at a lower level uh, than you. Can we say a prayer together? We thank you, Jesus, for your love for us and for the way you bring healing and love into our lives. Amen. Thank you for coming up. Good morning. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 29b. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. Will you join with me in prayer? Oh God, speak to us, speak to me in this, your word, that it may take flower in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. At the end of September, I'm planning out the sermons for the month of October, and we've got a stewardship drive, and we've got a bunch of other things going on, and I thought, aha, uh, on this, earlier in the month, we'll have a discovery time, and we'll have some questions and discussions about what it means to be a part of this church, and what our purpose is, and what we're going to be about going forward, and this is all going to fit together. And then on this Sunday, I'll have, having listened to you, I will put it in form and come up and announce it, and I'll, all will be good. Uh, plan B was, <laughs> in doing that, I discovered really the very wonderful diversity that exists in this place. We are a mix of people and rarely of one mind on anything. We are a people who see the church as an essential, if nonpartisan, contributor to the civic center of American life, exhibiting the best values of what it means to be an American in this time and place. And there are also those of us who believe that the church is the body of Christ, who, are, who is called, even mandated, to speak truth to power to offer a counter-testimony to the demonic forces of greed and racial oppression, hatred and fear that have emerged in American society and are now reflected in American politics. If the former group would never, ever risk a partisan stand, the latter group will hint a lot. Some of us see discipleship as the discovery of God in our lives, discovering a new God in scripture and especially in life. Others of us see discipleship as following Jesus in service of politics and our personal lives. 
Some of us are localists. What, that's a sociological term. Uh, the values that are important in our lives are the values that we learn here that help us to fit into this community of Elgin and sometimes even in particular a very small part of Elgin. Uh, and those, that's what's really important. If you want your minister to read a newspaper, it better be the Elgin Courier. Uh, not one of these foreign newspapers like the Chicago Tribune. Uh, others of us look upon Elgin as a dot in the wider world. And if you want to understand what's going on here in Elgin, you've got to understand it from a global perspective. And so the more discussion, the more different views, all the better. And we've got people in that group, too. They're called cosmopolitans. We've got people whose careers could be described as elite blue-collar workers, tool and die specialists. We seem to have a special on at one time. Uh, and then we've got others who would be called managerial or professional. We can also do a run on lawyers here. Uh, and they're together. We've got people with a religious perspective that uh, they'll believe it if they can sense it, if it's happened to them. If they can put their hands on it and touch it, then it's got a chance of being true. And we've got other people who think, you know, what's really real is going to emerge only at the end of time. And then God's love, God's word for us will fully be revealed in who we are and what happens to us. And that's just fine. There are those who see their spiritual journey as one that moves from separation and alienation with God and other people and ourselves to a reunion with God that brings resolution and meaning to their lives. And there are those who see the spiritual journey as one of conflict and ultimate victory in the continual struggle for the love of neighbor in the face of economic, political, and racial oppression. I could go on. Uh, but it is time to remind yourselves of one certain truth and an important question. The truth is, for all our just wonderful diversities and differences of opinion, if a stranger comes in from the outside, they will look around and they will say, you folk are all alike. I mean, we're at least 95% white, and most of us are of a certain age, uh, and uh, we're a pretty homogenous group. So we shouldn't overstate our perceived differences because there's a whole lot more that's similar than different. And the second is a question. Given the diversity that really does exist here, what makes us a community? What's the center? What's the core of our being here? And there are lots of answers that we sometimes give, uh, but they're answers for particular parts of the church. We're a church that serves. And for a lot of people, that is, that is a core value of serving other people. But a whole lot of other people aren't involved in that at all. Other people are totally engaged and absorbed in fellowship activities. Uh, but others don't do that. Uh, you see where I'm going, there's lots of different things, pieces to our puzzle, that don't line up into an easy definition. What makes us, what makes us a community? Now, the good news in this is for all our differences, we rarely see them as problems. I mean, they're interesting topics for conversation. They're not polarizing events. And that's good, except when differences freeze us into inactivity to think, we can't address this issue because it will make someone else angry. Or whether when we've got unacknowledged differences that keep us from the search for alternative strategies. So it's important to ask, what's our center? I think there is a point of connection between each of the points of difference outlined at the beginning other than the class differences between blue collar, blue class, uh, elite blue collar workers and lawyers. But I think the, the linkage that connects them is their spouses, uh, who oftentimes uh, transcend differences. And so 
from a sociological perspective. They're interesting in and of themselves. But for the rest of those differences of belief and practice, the figure that's in the middle of that is always Jesus. And differences in belief as to what Jesus does and who Jesus is and how we make sense of him in our lives. Uh, the difference between the church buttressing the civic culture of a democracy and being a force for liberation of the oppressed hinges on the question of what Jesus would do here and now. If anything, Jesus was God-centered more than self-centered. So the question of seeking the discovery of the divine or being Christ-centered is a bit more open-ended as to just how God can be found today. And the question between the empiricists and the romantics on Jesus depends upon who he was and is, and the question is far more interesting than either position would admit to. Our gospel lesson illustrates the point. Because the Gospel of Mark can be looked at as an extended crucifixion, uh, a crucifixion story of how Jesus died and then was resurrected with a long introduction. And the hinge in that Gospel, which pivots from one theme to the other, is this question that Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And there are lots of different answers that come out. And then Peter says, you are the Messiah. And the story goes on that Jesus tells them not to tell anyone. This is known in biblical scholarship as the messianic secret. Uh, why didn't everyone know that Jesus was the Son of God uh, when it was so obvious in the Gospels? And the answer that Mark gives is because Jesus told us not to talk about it and they discovered it later. Biblical scholars um, have a different take on that, and they say that Jesus as the Son of God was really, really discovered after the resurrection. And so they talk about post-Easter understandings of Jesus and pre-Easter understandings of Jesus. The traditional view, of course, is that the identity of Jesus focuses on two major themes, the crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, for Paul, it was the resurrection that was certain because he had experienced Christ after he was dead. And so he knew that. He had to explain why he was crucified. And so we get all of his letters. And we also understand Jesus because of the titles that were given to him. Son of God, Lord, Messiah, Christ. What both have in common is that they were formulated after Jesus' death and don't, the scholars tell us, seem to have been used during Jesus' life and certainly not by Jesus himself as a way of telling people who he is. The scholars would suggest that we stop reading with the, with the question and then think about how we would answer it. Who does Jesus, so Jesus would say in their view, who do you say that I am? And stop there. And then it's up to us to ask, answer, well, in my life, he's, and we fill in the blank. We did that in the Statement of Faith that was written in 1957 uh, in explaining who Jesus was to us at that particular time. We do this often in churches by what's important to us by what we lift up, those themes that we are constantly coming back to. Now, I'm not saying that the titles given Jesus or the focus on the crucifixion or resurrection are wrong. Far from it. But they are a description of Jesus derived after Easter before it. And too exclusive a focus upon them can lead us to a stained glass Jesus who was holy but not really human and rather distant from our lives. A sharper focus on the Jesus who lived before the crucifixion and resurrection, on the Jesus beyond the titles, points to a man who makes compassion for the hurting a spiritual practice, who teaches a form of wisdom that is contrary to the self-interest with which people looked at life both in his time and in ours, a man who was a social prophet 
and a movement founder, and a man who is not afraid, and who is not afraid, who does not hate, and indeed reaches out to those in his society who are considered to be other and dangerous and not fitting in. New Testament scholar James Breach describes Jesus as not being ego-oriented and not reactive, but they show a man who is totally oriented to directing consciousness towards being free people grounded in the kingdom of God. He is, in short, far more interesting than we find in the stained glass windows. He's a fascinating person, a person who continually arouses our curiosity and our interactions. And what labels we give to him, what titles, what meanings we derive from that are all just fine. It's part of the ongoing engagement with who this person is. An example, in my dissertation, I studied two churches. And the one, um, a traditional and conservative church, uh, had a ritual reading of the Bible. It was always on the altar. They lifted up the Bible as something to be revered. And there were two members who hosted a Bible study, which had three or four people who would come. Uh, and they could never get anyone else to come to their Bible studies. The radical church, the ultra-liberal church, had at one time five different Bible studies going on. And they were kind of no rules kinds of places. Uh, they were discussing, the men's Bible study was discussing uh, the Ten Commandments one day, and one man asked, so if you had to ditch two of them, which would they be? <laughs> you know, that, that's... That's more wide open than the people who are concerned about the holiness of Scripture generally want to vary. But the key point for me as a researcher was, hey, they got five of these groups going, and there aren't that many of these people. They're, they're in multiple groups. There was an ongoing engagement with the Scripture that came about uh, because of a passionate interest in it. Now, the Scripture can defend itself, doesn't need us to say what's right and what's wrong. It can speak to us just fine once we start to read it, once we start to engage it. And Jesus is the same way too. The more we discuss it, the more we will learn. The more we will find what he has to say to us in our lives and in this church. So whether you look at him primarily as the forgiveness of sins or the teacher of godly wisdom, as the son of God or the son of God, or that free person grounded in the consciousness of God, I think he is the center, the core of this community. There are no easy or automatic answers. There are no quick de definitions that allow us to move on to action points or on an agenda but an invitation to a relationship that is amazingly open-ended and speaks and reaches each person no matter where they are on the spectrum of opinions that exists in this place. There is room for everyone here. There are no defined answers, only a person who reaches out to us with love and wisdom to draw us into the kingdom of God, the realm of God, and God's ways. What we are about is figuring out the particularities of how this works for us. May it always be so. Amen. I invite you to take a few moments and think about these words.
Amen. We praise your name, O oh God. discuss with you why the question, what shall we bring, is so important to our congregation in 2019. Let's start by thinking about potlucks. I love potlucks, and I never go to a potluck without bringing some food. Why is that? Well, everyone's expected to bring food to a potluck or there won't be anything to eat. And when everybody does, there's more than enough wonderful things to eat. Potlucks, like all of life, are about expectations and the generous response of human nature. We cannot always meet the expectations that people have of us or that we even have of ourselves, no matter how well-intentioned we may be. But if we have no intentions, then we have no relationships. That is why we ask all of our members to express their financial intentions and commitments. This year, we have changed our approach slightly. We've scaled back the time and talent portion as it was just too complex for us to manage. Our hope is that you will find a way to express interest in ongoing commitments like leadership or service opportunities that occur regularly. The soup kettle, church school, office work, etc. If that is not your thing, we hope those with less time will state when they can be contacted when we need one-off projects like landscaping, aka weed pulling, substitutes for soup kettle, meals for shut-ins, love Elgin work, etc. We believe financial support is critical. Each member is a part of our financial lifeline. Any regular commitment is, is important as it teaches us that discipleship is rewarded with success. I believe that all can give something. When I was young, I could give more time than money. As I learned to give money, I found that I could only do it with regular practice. Then I had to write a check every payday. Now my bank makes it easy for me by sending a check automatically every month. Then I had children to support and a career to build. Now I am blessed with more time and more money to share. But like learning to play handball or golf, giving took regular practice. Please commit to practice the loving gift of giving yourself and your resources. One of the exciting things I've seen in the giving trends of our congregation is how almost everyone who makes a commitment, no matter how small, increases it year to year. And that's a great joy to see. Giving, like saying thank you, or looking on the sunny side of things, is a matter of creating good habits. Habits that help others even helps the givers themselves. Many counselors say if you're depressed, the best thing you can do is go out and help someone else because giving is an amazing difference. Please join the group of those who give. To assist in that, we've offered another option this year, the Faith Promise. For those who are uncomfortable publicly pledging a certain amount to the church, they can set a private goal and simply tell us, as an act of relationship building, that they have made a promise to God. I think every member can do that. I hope you do too. Making a weekly or monthly commitment and telling your bank to send a check to the church is easier to do than keeping a New Year's resolution. So try that in 2019 and forget about trying to lose five pounds. Who cares? Thank you, though, for being part of our potluck feast 
of faithful service to Jesus Christ. And on the 4th, when you come to church, if you forget your commitment card, don't worry. We've got an extra one for you. God bless you. After my first year in seminary, uh, I was a student intern in a rural church downstate Illinois. And the minister who was there, uh, one Sunday decided that, you know, we do the same thing every week on the offering. And uh, he would just wonder what would happen if we didn't do it. And so he left it out of the bulletin. And the church service starts and it sails through and they reach that point and nothing happens, and people are looking around, and, but nobody says anything, and then he goes into the prayers, and then he goes into this, and then he goes into that, and then there's the closing hymn, and he gives the benediction, and he starts walking back to the back of the door, church, to shake people's hands. And the oldest member of the church stood up and said, and the offering will be taken as you leave the church. Because this old saint knew that part of worship is giving back to God. And there was something missing if you couldn't do that. We pay bills, but we are giving to God. Let us bring our offerings to him. join me in the unison prayer of dedication. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for the blessings of love and friendship, for meaningful lives and relationships, for the opportunities we have in our lives. Out of gratitude to you, we extend these offerings of service and money that we might extend the blessings of your ways to others. Amen.
in this place we know the love of Jesus, the love of God. But as we go forth from this place, we can discover Jesus again. Let us do so. Discovering his love, his compassion, his grace, and carry on his work. Go in peace. Serve our Lord. Amen.